According to John's gospel, they took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Out of the darkness, we are reminded of the words, why do you look for the living among the dead? A compelling question asked of those first disciples when they peered into the tomb. Of course, why do we fall into the very same trap of looking for the living among the dead? It is Easter Sunday. It is a day to discover that death, in fact, holds no ultimate power over life or love. Today we celebrate the good news of resurrection. Jesus Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Through the darkness we have come, into the light we have emerged. Death is our past, resurrection is our present. Let the people shout together. Let the people rejoice. Let the people cry out. Let the people sing.
grace, you have rolled away the stone and the tomb is empty. Nothing can defeat the love you have for all creation. The night is gone. The dawn has come. A new day is born. Christ is risen, and we come to celebrate and honor you, the power of new life. Hear our songs and prayers as affirmation of our desire to participate in the new work you are doing in this moment. For you, O oh Lord, continue to roll away the stones of death. This we pray in the name of the resurrected one, Jesus Christ. Amen. It is such a joy to look out and see all of your smiling faces this Easter Sunday morning. What a blessing it is to all be in this place where we can worship our Lord together. The ushers are going to be passing out the attendance booklets. If you would take a moment to sign in. Members, we'd love for you to sign in. And for those that are visiting, Give us a little more information. Give us a phone number, an email, so that we can reach out and get to know you a little better. Each and every week at Cypress Creek, we take a few moments to reach out and greet one another and to give a warm welcome. Let's do that at this time. such a wonderful church. So thank you for letting me be here with you, okay? Now you guess, what's the second reason why I'm so excited about today? Because it's Easter. That's right, it's Easter. Okay, Quinn, you had your hand up. So what does Easter mean? It means that God, is on, that God goes to heaven and he got nailed on the cross. That's right, he got nailed on the cross and he rose again. So today we're celebrating his rising up, his resurrection, right? So, but what does that mean to you, him rising up and resurrecting? Do you guys kind of know what that means? No? Okay, so let's close our eyes and we're going to think about what it means. I'm going to tell you a little story. Okay, so close your eyes, guys. Okay. Well, it was a pretty hot summer day. And you just had to cool off. So you remember, in the freezer at home, there is some double Dutch chocolate ice cream. And you just knew if I get the double Dutch chocolate ice cream, I'm going to cool off. So you go and you sneak in, you get the ice cream, and you're just about done. 
And when you take the last scoop of the ice cream, oops, it drops on your white Sunday clothes. Bad news, because mom and dad didn't even know you had the double dutch ice cream. So you hurry and you take your white clothes off that are now stained and you put them in the dirty clothes. And so as mom and dad are washing clothes that week, they find your stained white Sunday clothes and they put it in the washer and you put soap and bleach and water and so it spins and it twists and it turns and they even use a little shout and it comes out the washer sparkling, glistening, clean. And that's the same thing. That's what Easter means. When Jesus rose again, it washed all of our sins away, just like the double dutch ice cream. So just remember that Jesus died so we can live forever. So when you make a mistake or you do something wrong, just pray to God and ask for forgiveness and he'll wash that sin away and make it just as white as your white Sunday clothes. So now do you guys kind of get what Easter means? Oh, louder, or else I'm going to have to tell it to you all over again. Do you get what Easter means? Yes. Okay, super. Now I know what Easter means, too. <laughs> guys, you ready? Because we have eggs to get, too. Okay? <laughs> Come on. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, to the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings laying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings laying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. Now Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, 
Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May the good news of Christ's resurrection bring to us the same joy experienced by Mary on that first Easter morning. Amen.
gracious God, we come together on this amazing day, this Easter Sunday where grace and love have come alive in a new and fresh way. May our hearts be made available to that gift as we celebrate resurrection, celebrate new life. We ask this in the name of the one who is that source of grace, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it was Easter Sunday, maybe 11, 12 years ago. I was serving a church at the time that on Easter had four services, like we did this morning, a sunrise service, and then our three regular services. I was just coming out of the sunrise service. I didn't have very much time before the next service. I came around the corner. I was greeted by a guy that I'd never seen before. And come to find out, he was a first-time visitor. He stretched out his hand. We greeted one another. And he says to me, for the last three years, I have gone to a different church on Easter Sunday, each year, a different one. I'm not much of a church goer, he said, but on Easter I'm always there, and for the last three years I've gone to different churches. And yes, the services have been nice. We've gotten together and we've shared wonderful songs about resurrection. We've shouted Hosanna and Hallelujah. It's been a wonderful celebration, but every year I've walked out of the service asking, so what? So, Pastor, are you going to answer the question this year? I was about five minutes before going into that next service, and I'm thinking to myself, can I rewrite the sermon <laughs> to answer this question? No pressure. And I mean, think about it for a minute. This Easter comes around every year. And I mean, generally, the story doesn't change. And so trying to come up with a so what every year, it's not easy. And I got to admit, that day I was a bit nervous. It's not easy. I mean, yes, we have four Gospels that do generally tell the same story, but well, do they? I mean, Mark's take on the resurrection is a little different than Luke's. And Luke's take on the resurrection is a little different than Matthew's. And John's, well, actually, there's a lot of differences in the way John talks about the resurrection as compared to Mark and to Luke and to Matthew. And one of those differences it's found in the words that Paula just shared with us. Those wonderful images after the disciples have left the tomb and Mary is there standing alone. She's weeping. And she glances into the tomb and she sees two angels. And one of them asks, why are you weeping? They have this conversation and Mary doesn't notice that Jesus shows up. And when she turns around and sees this man, the scripture says she did not recognize him. And she thought he was the gardener. She didn't recognize him. I mean, she has spent the last three years or so following this guy. She has probably spent more days near him than not. And she doesn't recognize him. I mean, even in the TV series, The Walking Dead, when somebody dies and becomes a zombie, at least for a little while, you generally recognize them. I mean, sure, they're a little more pale and stiff and they're using sores, but I mean, generally, I think you can say, yeah, that's Aunt Martha, isn't it? <laughs> but Mary looks at Jesus and doesn't recognize him. And he's not The Walking Dead, he's the walking, living. So, I mean, it's surprising that Mary didn't recognize him. But on top of that, she thinks he's the gardener. Now, in the Bible, there's sections 
where we have no details. There's these gaps where we're left kind of wondering what. So when you come to a, a detail like this, that she thought he might be the gardener, your pay attention meter should go off the scale. I mean, this should be something you're going, why? Why would she think that this was the gardener? Where else in scripture have we heard about a garden and a gardener? Because earlier in John's gospel, it said that Jesus was crucified, at least the way John tells it, near a garden. And there was a tomb in that garden. And it was that tomb in the garden where they lay to rest Jesus' body. So again, why the garden? Why the gardener? Where else do we know that story? Oh yeah, Genesis, right at the beginning of our Bibles. There is the garden story, the garden Eden, this wonderful image of perfection and peace, this wonderful image of, of oneness between humanity and God. And humanity is called, in a sense, to be those who tend the garden, a gardener. So why is it that that is so important to John? to bring us full circle there at the end of his gospel back to a garden on the eighth day. That's right, on the eight, John says on the first day of the new week, but that's the eighth day. In, in scripture, we tend to think of seven, seven days of creation, seven symbolizes completeness, but eight? Well, in fact, eight is an important number. Because it does mean new beginnings, the new, new uh, week, uh, a new creation. And what's fascinating to me is that throughout John's gospel, and only in John's gospel, in his earthly ministry, Jesus performs seven signs. Miracles, but John calls them signs. And then after the cross, we find ourselves in the garden on the eighth day, and there is the eighth sign. John is trying to communicate something to us. And as I was reading the scripture, as I was beginning to dig a little deeper, and as I unearthed this, I, I found myself falling back on my backside, and in the words of Dr. Sheldon Cooper, I said, Bazinga! I've never seen that before. Why? And it's because, at least as John's trying to help us understand, Easter is not just about one man coming out of the grave. It's not just about God vindicating the way of love. It is about finding in the resurrection a new day, a new beginning, a new creation or a, a new Eden. Well, even though I had never noticed that before, a lot of folks had. And what's surprising to me is it was the early church. It was early Christians who seemed to really resonate, who seemed to understand this. The earliest church buildings, very few of them stand. But some of them, where we still see some of the framework there, you would notice that the ceilings of the sanctuary, they depict God residing in the heavens. They painted the walls depicting Jesus standing with the angels and with the martyrs of the church. And the floor, where the people were standing, there on the ground where the community gathered, it was painted like a garden. It was their understanding that they were standing in the midst of the garden. And what's cool is some of the oldest sanctuaries that we know about. Stretching back to the fourth century, what we find is one in Capernaum and another one on the road between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. They have, count them how many walls, not four, not six, not seven, 
but eight. Eight walls. It's because the early church understood that this idea of resurrection, this idea of new beginnings, a new creation, is something that happens in and through the church right now, in this moment. One of the earliest Christian poets wrote, from the tomb of the garden, did Christ bring together the original garden in a marriage feast with the garden of paradise? I would suggest that too many Christians are stuck in the mud of the seventh day. Stuck in the mud, not realizing that we are supposed to be an eighth day kind of people. Not resting back on the seventh day, not hanging down, waiting back on the seventh day. We are an eighth day kind of people, which means that we are a people who are living in the garden who are a part of that new paradise and that new creation. Not in some future day, not some promised date, but now, right now. In Taravin, Czechoslovakia, back in 1941, the Nazis built themselves an internment camp. It took in more than the city, but out into the countryside. And they brought so many into that area as a stopping place before they were taken to Auschwitz. A lot of people came in. A lot of people went out and died. Word began to get out, though. The International Red Cross heard stories, and they began to press the Nazis to be able to open up and allow them to send in a group to see what was happening there. The Nazis pushed them off for a while, but finally, after a couple of years, they invited them in. But before they did, they went into the city, and they began to make it look good. They built a school. They built a a bank. They built all kinds of wonderful things, a coffee shop. But the one thing they did everywhere was they planted gardens. And as the International Red Cross came in and the Nazis filmed a propaganda movie, it all looked wonderful and perfect. And it was to be how the Nazis treated the Jews. And then as soon as the international uh, representatives left, they tore down all the buildings and they plowed under the gardens. And everyone that had participated in that was sent to the gas chambers. The world can talk about gardens. It can talk about some sort of new reality and new world. But when people are talking about it and yet still living in the old world and using the tools of the old world, the tools of hate and violence, shame and guilt, intolerance and injustice, it is not the Garden of Eden. It is not the Garden of New Beginning. It is not the Garden of New Creation that is being built. That is something that God built. And God has built it in and through Christ Jesus. What the world has built and the world has claimed is a facade. And we need to be a part of a different garden. And it's not one that we wait for. It's not one that's in the distance. It's one that is right now. And we as a people of faith are the ones that are to live it. This is to be in part the garden. But it doesn't just stay here. It goes out with us as we live it. As we live the idea that in the resurrection, we are a part of a new day, a new beginning, a new creation. When I was in seminary, I served as the student associate minister at First Christian Church in Mishawaka, Indiana. It was about a three-hour drive from the seminary, so every Friday I would make that drive up and stay until Monday afternoon and then drive back to school. While I was there, I would stay at the home of an elder. Mr. Widmoyer was his name. And I knew that just a year or 18 months before I arrived that his wife had died. And clearly he was still grieving. And yet at the same time, there was something very upbeat, very positive about who he was. 
And I learned pretty quickly what was the source of that. He was leading one of the men's prayer breakfasts. And we all came in, and there on the table in front of Mr. Widmoyer was this big bucket of dirt and a sheet next to him covering something that we didn't know what it was. As we all sat down, he told us that a few weeks earlier, he'd met a young man who had told him that the church is as dead as dirt. And he said, I've been rolling that phrase around in my head for a long time now. The church is as dead as dirt. And you know, he said, I'm coming to agree with him. That in fact, the church is as dead as dirt. Let me show you, though, Mr. Widmoyer said, let me show you what dead dirt can do. And he pulled back that sheet, and we're, underneath were these stunning Easter and tiger lilies that he had grown. And he said, look, that's what dead dirt does. It brings to life. It creates a garden. And then he went on to tell us about his wife's death and how painful that had been. But then he said, the church during that time came around me. And yeah, they talked to me about someday when I would be reunited with her. But what they talked to me more about was about how through God's love, Today was a new day. Today was an opportunity for new life. Today was a day of new creation. And he said, I just embraced that. And I fell in love with it. And he said, it was within a couple weeks, I started volunteering two days a week at the hospital, in part to show others this marvelous thing that I had discovered. He started volunteering every Friday at the homeless shelter, and one, month, one Friday a month, spending all night there. Because he said, these are people who don't need some promise a year from now, or 10 years from now, or 30 years from now. They need to know that in God and in Christ Jesus, that there is a new day, a new possibility, a new creation in the here and now. And we are the ones, we are the ones that are called upon to embody that, to live it out, to make sure that the world isn't just sitting around, that they're not stuck in the mud of the seventh day, but that they understand that we are an eighth day kind of people. Cypress Creek, Cypress Creek Christian Church, I believe, can be and is that way in so many wonderful ways, demonstrating that we are a people who are living in the garden. We are a people that understand the power of love and grace and forgiveness to transform our lives. And we are a people that are not afraid to be representatives of that garden, of that new day, of that new promise out in the world. It is a high calling upon us. It is. And yet, as John's gospel so beautifully displays, we are a part of it now, a new creation. The guy asked me, so what? I'm not too sure that Easter if I answered his question. But I'm still digging. I'm still searching, but I think John's gospel has something here. So what? Well, guess what? In the empty tomb, in the gift of the resurrection, new life to the broken, new hope to those who are grieving, a new life to those whose lives are falling apart. It is a new day, a new creation. And it starts now. Join me in prayer. Gracious God, you are the one of new life. You are the one of new beginnings. And we have awakened this day to the dawn of your glory. A glory found in a garden where life and love have been reborn, brought back from the dead. Too often, Lord, we find ourselves stuck in the mud of the seventh day, 
waiting and wondering when life will begin again, waiting and wondering when resurrection will happen, waiting and wondering with you, God, when you will bring an end to all that is hurtful and destructive and unjust. But you have called us out of our current circumstance and into an arena where promises have been fulfilled and unconditional love is real. You have brought us into that place where forgiveness is plentiful and justice pours down like an ever-flowing stream. Lord God, we may not always see it, but this community, alongside other faith communities, is a part of that garden, that garden of new life that you have planted through the gift of resurrection. Let us not just play in the mud of some past day, but celebrate the garden. Let us not just plop down in the dirt and wait, but see that the new creation, the new paradise that already has come into being. Let us embrace it. Let us live it. Gracious God, there are so many in our congregation that are hurting. And we lift before you Anne and Pat and Marvin and Betty and Carol and Dave. We lift up to you our sisters and brothers, both near and far, who are lost, who feel troubled, who are grieving. Today marks a new day, a new beginning. And the shockwave of the empty tomb is beginning to shake us up and to help us understand that we are not supposed to be back on the seventh day, but to be in the eighth day, the day of new creation, the day of new possibilities. Make that a part of who we are, not only as individuals, but as a community, so that others can clearly see. We offer all this in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. For our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. From the garden of new beginnings, from the garden of a new creation comes wheat and fruit that help to make the table behind us a true celebration of that new reality that has come into this world through Jesus Christ, that new reality that we as the church are called to embody. I still, I love that early Christian poet who wrote from the tomb of the garden, did Christ bring the original garden to a marriage feast with the garden of paradise? Here is that meeting place. Here is that feast. Here is that moment when we see those images of garden coming alive. Let us now taste and celebrate the meal that it provides.
Jesus was sitting at the table with his disciples. You may be seated. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the many for forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Here at Cypress Creek, we take communion by intention. We take a piece of bread, we dip it in the cup, and we eat. All are welcome to this table, for this is the Lord's table. If you are unable to come forward, if you will raise your hand, we'll be happy to come and serve you right where you are. Let us pray. Dearest God, what a glorious day for us as Christians to be able to come to this table and partake of the bread and the cup that represents the body and blood of your Son given for us. Today we celebrate the resurrection and the promise of eternal life. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the freedom that we have to worship without fear of prosecution. Help us to love as you love us. Help us to forgive as you forgive us. We pray in thy name. Amen.
this time in our service, we take up an offering. May each of us search our hearts and give back a portion of the many blessings that God has bestowed upon us. Let the offering be received.
I think for most of us, we think of Monday as the first day of the week, but actually Sunday is. It is the eighth day, because this is to be understood as the garden. This is to be understood as the day of the new creation. And I think that gathering together strengthens us in that understanding so that we can be a people who live out that notion. For the guy that asked me, so what? I tell you, I can preach until I'm blue in the face, but I'm probably not gonna convince anybody, but you all, going out and making that real through the way you care for people, for the way you are generous towards people, the way you welcome people, they will be touched by that. They will experience that. And I'm convinced they'll want more. They'll want to know that. So I give you thanks for those moments when you have been the people who are willing to live out the new creation. And I give thanks for those opportunities you will have not only this week, but on into the future. Here at Cypress Creek, we end each service with an invitation. It's an invitation into discipleship, an invitation into this covenant community. If you wish to respond to that invitation, you can do so in a number of ways. You can come forward as we're singing our hymn of discipleship, or you can meet with one of our pastoral staff or one of our church elders immediately after the service. Let us now join our voices on this amazing hymn of resurrection. You know, I see these people coming forward. I'm still learning the traditions of this church, being the new guy, and I bet you we're singing the Hallelujah Chorus, and some folks have decided to come up and join him. I'm glad they did. I do want to tell you, you know, for a lot of folks, you know, we've been building up through Holy Week to Easter Sunday, and it's like, whoo, we made it. Well, guess what? Church continues beyond Easter Sunday. There's a lot going on. I just want to tell you a few things. First of all, if you purchased an Easter lily in memory or honor of somebody and you want to take it, Feel free to do so. There are still some out in the foyer, or feel free to grab some from up here. Um, you know, take them home, plant them. I mean, it's amazing how they do reappear next year. Help create a little bit of that, that garden experience. In your bulletin this morning, there was an Easter offering envelope. That goes to support our overseas ministers throughout, the, uh, throughout our denomination. We have people that are a part of... Uh, churches that are preaching the gospel. We have folks that are part of hospitals and providing medical care. We have social workers who are responding to emergencies. So I uh, hope you will consider being supportive of that. We've been doing a NAM food drive, the, uh, the wonderful uh, ministry 
that uh, provides care and food for those who are hurting. I was told that if you forgot to bring your food, they won't be actually picking it up until midweek, so you can drop it off by the church uh, office sometime early part of this week. Next Sunday, the youth of the church are going to be doing the crop walk, which is a part of um, the National Council of Churches, and uh, it's the gathering together of Presbyterians and American Baptists and Episcopalians coming together for a walk to help raise funds that respond to crises around the world. So I hope you'll be supportive of the youth in that. And finally, Wednesday nights. We're getting back to our old routine on Wednesday nights this coming week. Dinner starts at 5.30. If you can't get there till 6, food's still being served. And starting at 6.30 for two weeks, I'm going to be teaching a class on prayer, conversations with God, and that runs from 6.30 to 7.30. Children's choir is happening at the same time. There's youth programming happening on Wednesday nights, so make note of that. And in three weeks, I'm going to teach the class for two, in three weeks, Jeff Mitchell is going to be here on Wednesday night. And Jeff is the, one of these guys that's amazing. Jeff uh, uh, went to a small town in Iowa and took a church of about 150. They moved it into an old Walmart, gutted the place. And a church of ten, or a city of 10,000, when you're averaging 1,100 in worship, it says something about what you're doing. Uh, but he decided that wasn't enough. He left that church and is starting a church in Chicago. And uh, he's going to be in town. He's going to share his story. And if you're wanting a little bit of energy, come and hear Jeff. He's just amazing. That's three Wednesday, three weeks away on Wednesday, April 17th. A lot going on. Be prayerful for these things. Now I invite you to grab the hand of somebody close. Gracious God, we want to be an eight-day kind of folk. We want to get out of the mud where maybe we've been stuck for a while back on the seventh day. We want to be a part of what you are doing and about the new life and the new beginnings that you are bringing into the world. God, there is a new creation, and it starts here in the lives of these people. Continue to bless us and encourage us so that we can live it out as we touch people with, with love and with mercy and kindness. We ask your blessing upon this, upon this ministry in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.